Um, yeah, hello everyone. Um, my name is Danai Fernandez. Um, Blacker is here with me today. This is the first time uh, I've done a workshop with someone else. And yeah, so this time I'm representing Cassie and then, well, Daniela is here representing Wixis, is that how you say it? And then <laughs> um, Zachary is here representing UB. And I know there are some people from chat on the, like here as well in the workshop. So yeah, first of all, I wanted to start just letting you know how you can get involved. So how do you get involved with Wixis? Here is the link, I mean, the QR code is to join their WhatsApp. So if you can take a picture of it and then that's their website and that's their Instagram tag. So that's how you get uh, involved with them and you know what's going on. So like you get to learn about events like this one and when they're happening and about the general meetings and whatnot. And also you join their, their email um, mailing list and then you get like uh, opportunities at FIU and whatnot. So it's a great opportunity. So definitely check them out. And then I have um, Kasi. This is our WhatsApp link. The QR code is for the WhatsApp. Then that's the website and that's their Instagram as well. They have a lot of events uh, going on. And on their Instagram, they post a lot of opportunities like research as well as events uh, like conference or something that they have uh, upcoming in the next couple of weeks. So definitely something worth taking out of all. And then for well, UPE, here is the UPE info. The, the social media handles are UPE FIU for Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and LinkedIn as well. And then that's the site, ubfiu.io and the Discord. And then um, chat. So, oh, I forgot the word, <laughs> the right? There were WhatsApp. But the one on the left is the Discord, the join the Discord. And the one on the right is for the WhatsApp, the WhatsApp group, which is only for announcements, but you can still like know what's going on from there. And then this is their site and their Instagram as well. So yeah, make sure to follow everyone and you know, you stay up to date what was going on at FIU and you can learn new things. And so if you want to connect on LinkedIn, here's my LinkedIn and here's Zachary's uh, LinkedIn. And you can also uh, drop some LinkedIn in the chat if you would like to connect with us or with other people at the workshop. Because, uh, well, from my experience, if you have connections, you can get jobs for yourself and you can even get your friends jobs as well if you know the right people. So I don't know, that's something I've learned. Um, yep. Let me, yeah, I'm gonna give everyone some time to get their LinkedIn on the chat. And in the meantime, I'm gonna get mine. i am put it in the chat as well. So it's easier for you and you don't have to type it out. Do you want me to put it or do you already have? I can put yours as well if you want. Oh, okay, thank you. Yep. Well, since that there is only one brave person in the whole audience that posted the LinkedIn, so. <laughs> Uh, there you go. Oh, sorry. I I thought I copied yours, uh, Zachary. I'm sorry. <laughs> I can post it. Oh, instead of it instead of I like, copy and pasting, I think I pasted pasted or something. There you go. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I see some more coming in. Nice. <laughs> Okay, so since everyone, yeah, I'm gonna wait until six then. Just that's how I love, I love these. I love connecting with new people, especially uh, when they're like in the same career and we attend the same school. So, okay, um, so let's move on. Oh my, I keep doing that. So I have a poll for everyone today. 
that's how I wanted to start. Um, let's see if I can do this right, because I've never done it before, but I think, yeah, there you go. Do you see it? Okay. So I see a lot of responses. Okay, I am gonna give everyone until I guess 45 seconds, would that be enough? Since, since uh, I guess most people have answered already. Well, actually, there are six people missing. I'm not sure if they were answered or not. Mm, I like that. There's still linking uh, links coming in the chat. Nice. Okay. So, yeah, this is in those people are going to answer. So, I'm going to end the poll right now. And I will share the results. So, since that 97% um, of you believe it's their job, to make sure the code is secure. Oh, I don't think the pool is getting recorded, so I would I would read the question out loud. So do you think it is the software engineers, developers responsibility to make sure the code is secure? 97% of you, uh, 29 people said yes. And then there's one person that said no. I don't really know who that person is, but if they want to speak up and say, why not? Maybe. Okay. Maybe in the chat, you want to say it in the chat? Or you can DM us if you don't want everybody <laughs> to know who you are too. Yeah. yeah, that's a good idea. I can sort of like writing the message or if they just don't want to say it. Yep. So yeah, we don't really uh, know who it was. I guess uh, some polls are anonymous, so that's a good thing. <laughs> and then, or I mean, it depends. Is but I could say not a bad thing right now. It's a bad thing, but yeah, we don't know who it was. Maybe they click no by mistake. We don't really know, so I guess I would just move on for now. If they uh, they want to speak up later, they can. Okay. So yeah, that wasn't as scary as I thought it would be. Okay. <laughs> so the pool is over and let's move on. So, okay. So wait, the title of the workshop was uh, Code with Security in Mind. So we see a lot of developers nowadays and you know, a lot of people making apps and a bunch of like new apps and new, well, web apps and mobile apps getting developed as well as game, games. But are they really like thinking about the information being secure and not being out there? Or like, you know, are they taking all the steps necessary to make sure they, they're not hacked, but they don't have like a simple vulnerability that they could have, uh, they could have prevented if they spent like 20 more times just looking at the, I mean, 20 more minutes, sorry, looking at the code. So that's kind of like um, the whole point of the workshop. We want to make sure there is no, uh, this kind of things happening, especially um, I would imagine most people uh, right here right now are aspiring software developers or like hoping to go into the, into some kind of like cybersecurity uh, field. So yeah, we don't want our code to be to be vulnerable to simple attacks if we can prevent that. So basically, um, what is secure coding? 
So as defined by Wikipedia, which is a funny resource to use, secure coding is the practice of developing computer software in a way that guards the guards against the accidental the accidental introduction of security vulnerabilities. The effects, bugs, and logic flaws are consistently the primary cause of common exploited software vulnerabilities. So that's what I was saying. You don't want your code to be hacked just because you didn't spend 20 more minutes looking at it. So that's one thing, uh, that's the main takeaway. On oh, one of the takeaways from today. Um, some applications, so it can prevent buffer overflows. And I don't know how much you guys want to participate, but does anybody know what a buffer overflow is? I want to say it in the chat, I want to mute and talk. I don't want to call people out of either, but. Okay, so Daniel says he knows, and I don't mind calling you out. What is it? <laughs> I already know you, know you, Daniel. What is it? Um, I can't say it. Okay, go ahead. Well, Daniel wants to explain it in text, so. <laughs> uh, you can but both yeah, give your basically, definition, go ahead. Basically, the way that data is stored, you have addresses. And basically, if your program does not take into account um, having numbers or data that's going to be larger than the space that you have, this can leak to another addresses. And this can have unexpected behavior. And especially when hackers, because hackers use this especially um, to get into other parts of your system um, or something like that, more or less. That's pretty good. Thank you. And then Daniel's still typing it. He's like typing sentence by sentence. Okay. Yeah, so Daniel um, is just starting explaining. So he's like, some data has X amount of storage, essentially pushing more than it can take will cause it to leak. Okay, yeah, that's what Mia says, uh, said as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, too slow, Daniel. Miguel already said that, but yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so buffer overflows are a common software vulnerability that happens when a process tries to store data beyond a fixed length buffer. So that's why the name. So it's it has a fixed size and then you try to store more data than, than, than it can handle. So it overflows. And then it also prevents uh, format string attacks. I don't know if somebody knows what that is. Let's see. Maybe not. <laughs> I guess not, because I'm not seeing any messages come about that. Um, okay. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, if you use like a format that is not as specified for the program, it can cause the program to crash, crash I think, or something along those lines. That's, that's, but maybe that's not. Uh, I got you both uh, spoke at the same time, so I'm not sure what you said. It's similar to have a secure software that you use, they use to actually identify like variable, like, you know, string letter, you know, string variables in general, string values, which is used to actually, you know, find vulnerabilities in the code or to solve vulnerabilities in the program. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, in so I don't know if you're familiar with some kind of like print f a statement that would have like the little ampersand or the percentage and then like an s or some kind of like that for the 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 percentage symbol and the f I mean the the d or whatever it is that you're giving it and then so that packer takes advantage of that yeah like that like what Packer sent in the chat. And then the attacker takes advantage of it and he sends something else that could be interpreted differently by the program. 
So that's something that you could prevent using secure coding. Okay, so I, I think I'm taking too long and <laughs> I noticed it's already 620. So it also prevents integer overflow prevention. I mean, yeah. So, you know, like in Java, this is kind of like the same thing we're talking about, but this one's like a specific for integers. So in Java that you have like a, an int, and it has like uh, four bytes or it can, I don't know the exact numbers, but it's like from two million uh, positive to two million negative or whatever the number are, the numbers are. And then if you try to put a bigger number, it will not fit because it, it will be too large. So that's something you can prevent if you're using secure coding as well. And then the last one, uh, path traversal. So that one is where the path provider from an untrusted source can be uh, interpreted in such a way that you can access it. So if you have a, a path from an untrusted source, but you're interpreting it in a way that you can access it, even like you can access files, even, oh, <laughs> Tucker is giving all the info. Okay, you wanna read that number <laughs> for me? Yes. 2,147,483,647. Thank you. And the negative one too, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, you want me to read the negative no, one? No, 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 that's fine. It's the same number. Yeah. <laughs> and then, yeah, the path traversal, I thought I, I finished explaining it. And so yeah, that's the main point in the workshop. We wanna make sure none of these things happen because it would take a lot of time and it would be easier to prevent. So definitely want to make sure they're not happening to us. And then let's move on to the next slide. So yeah, the main thing I wanted to focus on is like a type of secure coding that is called defensive coding. And then there's all the types. There's like offensive coding that fall under defensive coding and there is more as well. But yeah, this is the one I wanted to focus on. So ensures the continuation of that the work that the code or the program still works even though something happened. So if there's an if there's an error that you didn't thought it could happen, your program will still work after it after it happened because it even though it didn't expect it, it you were prepared for that, so you your program will be fine. And then so defensive programming practices are often used where high av availability, safety, or security is needed. So that's something to keep in mind. If you want those three things, you can use defensive programming. And then, of course, like everything, you cannot use a lot of it because like you can use as much as you need, but like don't go overload because if you have a lot of code that you're trying like this approach on, then you might have runtime, like a high runtime and you never want that. And you have like a lot of uh, time spending trying to maintain that code because you have a lot of uh, security practices on it. So it's always good to have the balance between, you know, my code is secure, but I'm not spending a lot of time on maintaining it and it's not taking three hours to run. So, yep. And then, so what do you want to accomplish with defensive coding? You want your code to be good. So you want to reduce the number of bugs and problems. You also want to make sure your code is com comprehensible. So you want to make sure it's easy to read. That's why I said, make sure you don't have a lot of uh, defensive code on it because it would probably be difficult to read it after if you do. And then making the software behave in a predictable manner despite unexpected inputs or user actions. So that was a lot of information, I guess, and I just wanted to simplify it into a sentence. So basically, defensive coding allows you allows your software to behave in a correct manner just by incorrect input. So that's the simplest way you can define it, and that's the way uh, I want you to remember it. And moving on. So how do you do defensive coding? I mean, there is a lot of ways. Um, you can always have your own uh, ways. Of course, you have to do this on your own as well, even though it says code reviews and it's highlighted and it's bolded. That doesn't mean you didn't do it in your own time. Uh, but yeah, 
So whenever you're coding, you always have this in mind. And the next slide has a lot of useful information that it would be really uh, good if you read through it. And we'll, you'll see when we get there. But yeah, so code reviews is a way to do it because you want to make sure your, your program not only meets your design goals, but it also meets your security goals. You want your program to be secure, and that's, yeah, that's the main. I don't know. I feel like that's a, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm very much about security, so I want my program to be secure above all. So hopefully some of you are like that too. I don't want like information getting in the internet or something that's not supposed to happen to happen. So. And so going into them, so some things you got to keep your eye out for. Hard-coded secrets. So yeah, make sure you don't leave any hard-coded stuff into your, your code, like your source code once you publish your program. What if you imagine you leave like a password? That wouldn't be uh, very cool. Or like you use a name or something like that. You don't, you don't want to leave that there. And then, of course, you want to make sure your program is not affected by SQL injections. So, well, we don't have a lot of time to go in, like, into deep. There's a, a lot of different types of SQL injections. We're going to discuss an example of them in a little bit. But yeah, basically, you want to make sure your code is not taking any input that shouldn't be taken. And then information disclosure. So this one pretty much is just referring to when you have an error. So instead of saying line three of the code doesn't work or I don't know, something like really uh, descriptive or giving out like a password, you never want to give out a password, obviously. Something like that, don't, don't ever. Just say like uh, error or like uh, something's broken. I don't know. Something simple that doesn't give any information away about like what database you're using, what, mm, what uh, I don't know, what user is trying to log in, whatever it is, don't, don't give that information away. No, well, not the end user. Well, both. I mean, you don't know if the end user is trying to hack you. Daniel? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't do that. Uh, so Zachary said in the chat, your password ABC123 is incorrect. Do you mean ABCD1234? <laughs> so yeah, don't, don't do that. That's, that's bad. And then, yeah, cross-site scripting. So you don't want that either. Yeah, we don't have a lot of time to get into it right now, but definitely make sure your site is not, is not, is not vulnerable to them. And I'm pretty sure there's uh, websites or some kind of applications out there that lets you check if your site is vulnerable to SQL injections or cross-site scripting. So it's definitely worth checking into. And then, yeah, input data validation. So you want to make sure um, you're checking the input you're getting. I mean, some of them are simple. Like if you don't want to get an address if you're asking for an email, that's not that doesn't have much to do with security. But yeah, that's something you gotta <laughs> want to check against too. And another way um, to check is like so, if you're asking for the day of birth, you know they didn't they weren't born in 1800. So make sure you're checking like your date that you can input is between, I don't know, 1950 and, and the present time, depending on what you're doing. Uh, but yeah, so that's something you want to make sure too, because what if they give you like a 1900 date and your program breaks or they get access to something they're not supposed to. And same with numbers. Like if you're expecting a number from five to 10, why are they able to input four? They shouldn't be. And um, so, yeah. That was um, like a little introduction to defensive coding. And then, so next slide, um, I really uh, recommend looking into this. So 90 application security web practices. This is a whole list of best practices that, oh, he's one step ahead of me, okay. So yeah, Zachary already sent the link in the chat. Um, yeah. I can share the link, all the links, like to the discords and all that later uh, in an email with everyone that RSVP. So I can do that later and I can share this link as well. But yeah, there is 90 
uh, different, like, well, some of them I already covered. I guess like input validation, make sure it's not, there is no SQL injections or cross-site scripting attacks and all that. But yeah, there is 90. So there is a lot more he's covering that we don't have time to go over right now. So definitely um, check it out. And then my favorite part, because I don't like all the concepts and stuff. Let's go to the, the real life example to see if somebody wants to participate. So, well, um, who wants to say what the code is doing? <laughs> if somebody wants to participate now. I know Zachary wants to, but mm, not it's fair. It's obviously a login uh, or like a sign it, account sign in function. Mm -hmm. And then what's Where, uh, the, the, the if? Uh -huh. the, the if branch is uh, obviously uh, like an error, uh, not an error, but like uh, it's checking if the, if uh, the login information is invalid. Mm -hmm. So if there is not an email, there would be an error, right? Yeah. And notice how they have like the error they're showing or the exception says that. Oh, thank you for participating, by the way. <laughs> it says invalid response from Facebook and it doesn't give you any more information at all. But is, what about the, so see how I have at the bottom of the slide, I have, there is no ex, an existing user with the email and then I put an example email. But that's giving you more information. That gives away the name of the person that's trying to log in. And imagine instead of that, I had, there is not an existing user with email this, but then I had what Zachary said earlier, but how about this name one at gmail.com and their password is blah, blah, blah. Imagine that, that would be terrible. So definitely don't want to give that information out. So invalid response from Facebook is the kind of messages you want to um, have on your code. I mean, it would be kind of difficult for you to debug it later, but definitely worth uh, doing it because you want to make sure your information is secure and your app is secure. And I wouldn't be using your app if I notice it's not secure. So I'm sure other people out there are on top of that. Okay, so this is another example. Oh, I'm sorry, the, the picture is a little blurry. But this is an example of an SQL injection. So if you notice there, it says select accounts from users where login equals legal user, and then it says, exec like execute and then the char function and then a lot of well that's ASCII so a lot of coding <laughs> like a big number in there I don't want to read uh, big numbers today apparently so yeah and then so the hacker is taking advantage of your app being vulnerable to SQL injections and he's telling the computer to shut down so if you see down there, I wrote that the whole execute uh, char of text is equal to shut down. So basically when your computer selects all the accounts from users, it's gonna shut down. And yeah, I mean, I already explained it. Um, it's using the char function and ASCII hexamal encoding. And my next slide is even better, I love it. So here I have, so I went to this random site on the internet and I <laughs> ran some SQL code just to show you how um, you can get shut down from there. So I'm sending this site right now on the chat and then I'm gonna send all the lines of, all the lines that I ran. So if you go there and, I mean, you can go to any other site or if you have like, uh, I don't know, Microsoft SQL Server or some, some database management app, you can run it or like SQL. Well, I don't know if you can run it in VS Code, I never done. And so, yeah, I just wanted to show that. I thought it was um, very nice. So yeah, I think I'm done now. Um, any questions for me before we go over? You did a good job. We give it over to Zachary. Thank you. Okay, like, 
Yes, you did a good job, and to a extent, I got no questions whatsoever. But I just want to hear saying that you did a good job. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, um, Zachary, you're up. Hello, it's my turn. My turn. So, um, I'm going to talk about some more real life examples. Um, the first one that I I was searching them up and I was researching, and this one was uh, kind of a big one, but not too much. Um, is that Uber actually had an endpoint on their website that allowed uh, for brute force attacks relatively easily. They had no precautions against against it, except for some accounts that had a feature enabled called um, Geofence. And what Geofence does is it allows specific uh, geographic areas, either they can, they can either section it off of based on IP or other input validation. Um, it just focuses on your location. So some uh, accounts had this attached to their account and had that extra verification, had that extra security, um, but some didn't. And what this allowed this people to do is they allowed, uh, like they tested a bunch of combinations with a bunch of random accounts and they were able to brute force their way into accounts and gain access to services and use businesses' credit cards to buy Uber services. Um, which in the case of Uber, it might have not been that much, um, depending on how much uh, transactions they did, because they if it's just like an Uber ride, it might be like 20 bucks. If they did it like six times, it might have been just like 120 or something. So it's not too big in that terms, but it wasn't secure at all because they were allowed access to accounts just by putting in random passwords, like every possible combination. Could you go to the next slide? Okay, I was looking at my computer. I was like, what? Okay, um, so what Uber could have done to prevent it. Um, so usually when you have a backdoor that is just like an open endpoint, you have a couple of ways you can like circumvent it and easily stop attackers from brute forcing their way into accounts. Um, one of the most common ones that most people will be familiar with is the CAPTCHA, ReCAPTCHA. There's a bunch of them out there. Um, that could either be provided by another company or it could be provided by your company. Um, one of the most important things to consider when you do that is it should be close to 100% impossible for a computer to do it and then almost 100% possible for a human to do it. That's one of like the main objectives for it when you do implement it. Let's say it's just like select the correct picture and there's three of them. That's a 33% chance. That just means you're dwindling the amount of requests by 33% because the computer can pick a random one. Um, so it's kind of important to implement that properly. There's also the method of limiting the amount of requests a single IP address can request at a, like in a certain amount during a certain time. So my individual computer can only let's say make four requests as a login attempt to let whatever website. And then after the fourth attempt, my specific IP address is locked. So I'm done with my tries for the next like minute or two. That way I can't do like a thousand in one minute or something. And then I have like 10 computers doing a thousand, you know, now they can only do four. So the brute force attack kind of fails. Um, the last method that I introduced here, but there's a couple other more is that you can actually just lock the account from all login attempts. And this one has the main benefit of if I have a bunch of computers, kind of like I just said, but we have like a bunch, bunch of them, um, which can be done in different ways, either through a virus or just procuring them. And they all have different IP addresses. And I try to brute force this specific computer and each one's just gonna do like 10 login attempts. Then um, all they have to do is 10 each and it's over because they have like a 10,000 computers or something. So the last one kind of tries to prevent that because if there's even 10,000 computers, each only doing 10 after a certain amount of, let's say, I don't know, maybe maximum 20, it stops the rest of like the thousands of requests that are gonna come in for that specific account. So that account in particular can't get proof forced opened. Um, just reading the chat real quick. You whitelist the IP. Yeah, exactly like, like Daniel said, or you better, you whitelist the IP. So that when you create set account only a page you can try, that's what we do for the government. Um, exactly. You can also, another way that kind of Daniel said, it's a little more impractical and it's a burden on the user. Um, is that you make it so that they can only access it using a specific IP or a very, very specific range of IPs. That way, 
they can only use that and other IPs will have absolutely zero to no chance to access whatever endpoint that you want. Um, another drawback for the second one, ooh, could you go, another drawback for the second one is that uh, if you're like, you forget your passwords all the time, just like I do, and your user, you're gonna input your password like five times and then it's all over, you have to wait a minute and it's super frustrating for a user that forgets their password all the time like me. Um, so the second one has that drawback and the first one has the drawback of if you're an application and you wanna make an API request, um, it might be a little more difficult to actually verify their account because now it has to complete a CAPTCHA and, it, and the, you know, the app can't do that. So it either has to circumvent it to the user or something and it makes that process a little more complicated uh, with the first one. So that's like the major, major drawback because there might be applications out there that interface with Uber to either show you like all Uber, Lyft and whatnot, or it just wants to access this Uber's API with your account in some way. Okay, can you go to the next one now? So I'm just trying to open the chat. Okay, so the next one I want to talk about is actually what happened with the Department of Defense. Um, if you actually research it, they actually have a bunch of uh, like little small things that get that get like opened uh, in the Department of Defense all the time. I thought it's, it's pretty interesting to search up and read some of them. Um, this one in particular was they had an endpoint that was PHP information and it allowed for anybody to just go on their website at a specific uh, endpoint and look at the exact operating system, PHP version, and a bunch of the important stuff that people can use to make attacking a system much, much, much easier. Especially if something's out of date and you're giving away this information. Um, the updates are not just there for more features, they're also there for security cautions. And as a developer, you have to be aware that when PHP comes out with a new version and you're running PHP, you should most likely get the new PHP version just in case because there could be security and vulnerabilities and displaying your security and vulnerabilities by in the form of like what version you're running is exactly what you're not you, you don't want to do you really don't want to do that because it makes it so much easier for the attacker to do that okay could you get the next one so the final one I wanted to talk about was Dropbox. Dropbox actually had a open endpoint for one of their Git repositories that people could just view and whatnot. And you could look at their personal code that they use for Dropbox. Now this is pretty important because Dropbox's whole idea is they host your company's your, your files or your company's files and they provide some type of encryption service so that you have access to your files or your company has access to the files and no one else does. That's the whole appeal to cloud storage and whatnot. Um, so when a repository of theirs gets public like that, like they on their file sharing service system, then it's much easier to look at that and be able to say, wow, if they use this type of encryption, I can crack it like this or attackers are able to formulate something just because they were unable to like prov like cover for this vulnerability. Um, luckily in this particular case, Dropbox the repository didn't have information that would help an attacker um, actually get like uh, into people's secure data. So that was fortunate, but th that's usually not the case. Usually it's sad stories. Um, could you get a next slide? So I went to talk about this attack, even though it was like kind of a happy story because I think it's super, super relevant to every single stage of developer. And that's because almost every single stage of developer is encouraged to use GitHub. And uh, Denai mentioned it earlier in her presentation that you don't want to like put your passwords up on your stuff. You don't want to put stuff, public information. You don't, you want to keep it secure and on your local machine or better yet, like on a piece of paper or something like you, you don't, you want to keep it away as, as possible from actually putting it online and being able, other people able to see it. 
So um, one of the most important, like the most, the worst one that I think could happen is that if you have something like maybe Amazon Web Services and you put your API key for them and your credentials and whatnot, just because your service uses that, like whatever application you're developing uses it. So you need to put it in the program. Um, so you like, you know, you put it on the repository and you post it and you go to sleep and you could rack up thousands in charges from using the Amazon Web Services that you're not even using. Someone else got your credentials and just used it to exploit their own thing or do anything. Um, and you could have wrapped up millions. And the problem, like most people might be like, oh, I'm such a small developer. There's actually like bots that go through GitHub repositories and just try to get these credentials because it's very profitable, obviously. So it's really important not to post your secure data when you're, even if you're starting out, even if you're an advanced developer, it can happen to anybody, um, not to post your data up onto GitHub, that's secure. And don't keep your password paper on a sticky note inside of it. Oh yeah, <laughs> like uh, don't don't put your password of your laptop right on the on the screen of your laptop, because you know they have to they have to get your laptop to you know go into it. So that's just giving up. Mm -hmm. no point of a password at that point, right? I was gonna save it on your computer, or I was save it on your like your manager or your, your account, basically your account manager. Wait, or put in a book, or put your password in a book or something like that, or pamphlet, or go to stand, save it on your password management. Or Google if, you password. A, if you said in a book, I mean, what I'm trying to refer to is Google Password Manager. That's what I'm referring to. Google Password Manager. Uh, Always remember. Well, password managers, I, I think, are fine, but they they're like a kind of a big security concern if they do get leaked or anything. Like you having them all in one place like that. Um, so like that that's I would say that's not a topic to really talk about that much in this one because we're more focused on coding with security rather than keeping your data secure personally. So it's like another thing to talk about, but it is kind of similar. Like we wanted to focus on um, like what you, your coding practices, like how would that could affect you in the future and how you should code securely and make sure you're not gonna get exploited and whatnot. Best password manager, pen and paper, yeah. <laughs> Pencil and paper, that way you, you can scribble out the password and you have to change it. Okay, could you get on the next slide? So in the end, we need to strike a balance between coding securely and uh, coding, coding securely and practical coding, because it might not be practical to super, you know, cover every single case that might come up. Like you might be stuck in a big loop of adding all these conditions that could, 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 could happen. But in the end, like they might not, they probably never or will never actually happen. And, you know, the downside of this is you're wasting your own time trying to check for these conditions, these conditions that will never happen. And well, this is a worst case scenario. And you're also gonna, the uh, runtime execution, the execution speed of your code, uh, depends on like whatever you're doing, it's gonna suffer because you're doing all these checks in cases that might not ever happen and like we need to be careful not to defensively program too much, but it is important to defensively program to the point that your users' data are secure and um, your data is secure as a programmer. Okay, so these are some resources. That's the end of our workshop. Did I want to say anything? No, I just wanted to say if anybody has any question or if or if you guys want to talk about something, I can stop the recording and we can have a nice discussion. Because I don't know if the recording is scaring you off. <laughs> oh wow. Nobody has any questions. I guess um, I, I guess we could talk about uh, password managers for now. <laughs> it's
So yeah, I use the password manner. Um, honestly, I'm too lazy to use the one Adro suggested to use a pen and a paper because that would mean I would need to type in 20 characters every time. And yeah, I'm already lazy enough to kind of want to <laughs> like be annoyed every time I had to use 2FA. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I, I use it. I know I need to, but like, um, keeping my password on a pen and a paper will be uh, too much. <laughs> yeah, me too. Honestly, I don't. I don't keep any. I keep some of them that like, like a uh, very few that like uh, like virtual machines or something like very specific ones on a pen and paper. But like general ones for websites and whatnot. Unless it's some website that I really care about, then I I don't really care that much. Like nobody's gonna be trying if they do get in like there's there's not like that much they can do for the stuff that i have password saved so you know i don't mind that much the well it's kind of annoying too because like now whatever you go you have to log in yeah kind of so you have to keep a lot of passwords and then yeah. if you use the same passwords and then you've been paused then you're in you're in trouble yeah especially if you use the same passwords then it gets deep that's just for shame yeah, you don't want that. Um, oh, I think we can share uh, the links of the examples you spoke about. Yeah, let me, I'll copy it. Oh, yeah, I would have stopped the recording now. Uh, yep. <laughs>